Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, babies and citizens, this joy to the world. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, babies and citizens, this joy to the world. I bring a message of the truth amidst a world full of lies. I graduated from learning lies to seek the truth. Indoctrinated to be too blind to see the proof. I once was lost, but now I'm found, so I shine light. And everywhere I go is darkness, so I shine bright. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Throughout life, we try to find common ground with people all around us, but it's the uncommon ground that we didn't know we had in common. Uh oh, <laughs> I'm Wes Blaze, and I'm joined by my brother in the faith and my co host, Sean from Kingdom in Context. What's up, Wes Blaze? This is uh, so much fun to do this show. Thanks for having me back on, and uh, I'm kind of excited for what we get to get into today. No, thank you for joining us, man. This is the show where we teach the world the truth of the creation model that God you know, proposes in his word and how each individual component relates to the overall message of salvation that God has for mankind. And I, I couldn't think of anybody better to do it with. So thank y'all for, for being here. And uh, we'll get a lot of great stuff to cover. We've been working hard on this episode and I'm excited to show you guys what we have. Yes. Yeah. Geocentricity. No seriousness. Episode two. It's yeah. exciting. It's exciting. Guys, real quick. First of all, as we mentioned last week, um, we are, we are, doing a project uh we showed last week in episode one the layers of the ferment we showed how it has multiple layers we went over all the scriptures went over some proof of science but we also announced that we're doing a patreon project where um you can actually help us fund the, the project to build a to the best of our ability wes right we can't we can't make like um, an electromagnetic sun but we can we have other ideas on how we might light up the sun put it inside this model and tonight, Wes, with our geocentricity episode, we're going to be reviewing some verses from First Enoch that actually we'll be using in the model as far as the gateways that the sun travels through inside the circular circumference of the heaven over our heads. That'll so be great. It's kind, of, it's kind of exciting. Guys, go to our Patreon if you want. Let me put it on screen for you. Um, go check us out. We have a couple different membership levels um, if you want. You know, at the lowest level, you get a T-shirt with every level, but some of the other levels allow you to contribute to the project at a little bit healthier pace um, because it is going to cost. You know, we, we got people volunteering that are professionals, but it is going to cost some things for all the supplies and materials that we'll need for doing it. So what we're going to do, um, what we what we announced last week, Wes, is we're actually going to be um, testing. We're going to be filming everything. So I'll be filming, you know, the consultations we have with the people that are helping to build it. We'll film the planning, what scriptures we're going to go over. We'll film the actual, you know, construction as well as the testing of it. And then once we get, you know, a working model, it may take us six or seven months. But once we get a working model, then we get to go back and use it. And you can use it as an illustration tool when you're trying to teach people about the biblical creation model, because we're going to go through and, you know, attach all the scriptures to the different pieces of the model. So you can see why it was constructed the way it was. That's right. And there's nothing else like this. Nothing like we what we're trying to put forward. So. Yep. Definitely uh, help us yeah. out. We yeah, love your the Patreon link is in the video description below. So yeah. hit us up on Patreon if you like the show and want to support us. Speaking of Patreon, we're going to be doing a giveaway here coming up soon. We don't have all the That's details right. buffed out on it, but uh, we want right. to give away some cool holographic stickers. And uh, right. we'll be talking about that soon, but that's for uh, Patreon members. So if you wouldn't mind helping us out, come check us out on the Patreon. We'd love it, We'd love it for it. <laughs> yeah. yeah we're we're actually still we'll probably announce it by next week but we're, i think we're still working on our other gift that we're due for the giveaway and we'll probably do it after a month's time period so then whoever's a patreon after a month will choose a winner from those patrons for this giveaway so yeah. i have some ideas that uh i'm just still checking on the pricing of it but yeah i think you guys will like the giveaway come come check us out on patreon it'll be a lot of good a lot of good stuff real quick though um just as a real quick te teaser to everybody next week we're going to be having on Mike Maranatha and reviewing some of his music. So we're going to tell you a little bit more about that at the end of this episode. So be sure to watch to the end. And Wes, it looks like we got quite a few people watching and in the live chat right now. Do we? Yeah. Fantastic. Welcome, everybody. Glad to have you here. Yeah, we got quite a few people. All right. So let's see here. Hi, Mom. <laughs> and your mom's watching. <laughs> 
<laughs> All right. So here's a quick little introduction to this, uh, this episode that we got here about geocentricity and historical artifacts related. In astronomy and in cosmology, astronomy. the geocentric model is the description of the universe with Earth at the center. According to the geocentric model, the sun, moon, stars, and planets all orbit Earth. This was the predominant understanding of the cosmos in many ancient civilizations. In the 4th century BC, Greek philosophers Aristotle and Plato were public figures who were known as proponents of geocentrism. The astronomical predictions of the geocentric model by Claudius Ptolemy, developed around 100 AD, served as the basis for preparing astronomical charts for over 1500 years, holding prominence as the consensus until the late 16th century. It wasn't until then that the heliocentric models of Copernicus, Galileo, and Kepler gradually began to supersede the commonly accepted cosmology of antiquity. There was much resistance to the transition between these two theories, recorded all the way into the 1900s, re-emerging again in recent decades. But over 2,000 years ago, when geocentrism was widely understood as fact, Inventors created tools and instruments based on their observations of the heavens. These devices were used for an astounding variety of purposes with the common denominator being they were all developed and functioned contingent upon all the celestial bodies revolving around the Earth. The Antikythera mechanism is an ancient Greek hand-powered orrery, or a mechanical model of the universe used to represent the positions and motions of the heavenly bodies in relation to the Earth. Known by some scholars as the world's first analog computer, the oldest known Antikythera is dated by archaeologists to as early as 150 BC. It was used for astronomical, calendrical, and navigational purposes and was used to predict astronomical positions and eclipses decades in advance, down to the specific date and time of each phenomenon. This complex piece of engineering, consisting of 30 bronze gears connected to dials and pointers, even depicts the retrograde motions of the five planets recognized by ancient Greek cosmology. Almost all of the mechanism's gear wheels could fit within a space only 25 millimeters deep and had separate hands for the sun, moon, and each of the five planets. A rotating ball showed the phase of the moon and dials on the back acted as a calendar, showing the time of lunar and solar eclipses. Inscriptions explained which stars rose and set on any particular date. Michael Edmonds, a Cardiff University Emeritus Professor of Astrophysics, wrote in the Journal of Contemporary Physics, even though at the time, the Greeks were aware of the possibility of a sun-centered view of our solar system, the Antikythera mechanism was still firmly geocentric in all its models. An early astrolabe was invented in the Hellenistic civilization by Apollonius of Perga between 220 and 150 BC. This astronomical instrument was a handheld model of the universe used before the development of the sextant. When you have an astrolabe, when you understand an astrolabe, you've got the universe in the palm of your hand. Its various functions make it an elaborate analog device capable of multiple astronomical calculations. The astrolabe is able to measure the altitude of a celestial body above the horizon, day or night. It can be used to identify stars or planets. It can tell you when the sun will rise. It can triangulate the latitude of your location given local time, or vice versa to determine the time of day. Astrolabes can even measure the height of a building as a surveying tool. In classical antiquity, the Islamic Golden Age, and the European Middle Ages, astrolabes were popular for all of these purposes. In its basic form, it consists of a disc with the edge marked in degrees and a pivoted pointer. One widely employed variety, the planispheric astrolabe, enabled astronomers to calculate the position of the sun and prominent stars with respect to both the horizon and the meridian. This was accomplished by aligning the astrolabe perpendicular to the horizon. Popularized in the 1700s, the sextant is a navigational instrument so named because of its graduated arc encompassing one-sixth of a circle, or 60 degrees. It uses a mounted telescope and mirrors for measuring the angular distances between objects. By calculating the angle between the level horizon and at least three celestial bodies, a user could determine their position according to latitude and longitude. This kind of celestial navigation is dependent upon the fixed order of the stars in what modern astronomy calls the celestial sphere. 
The Encyclopedia Britannica defines the celestial sphere as the apparent surface of the heavens on which the stars seem to be fixed for the purpose of establishing coordinate systems to mark the positions of heavenly bodies. A planisphere is a star chart and analog computing instrument in the form of two adjustable disks that rotate on a common pivot. The rear disk has a map of the unchanging constellations printed on it, while the front has an oval window or horizon overlay which determines what part of the sky is visible at a time you choose. It can be adjusted to display the visible stars for any time and date and can assist in learning how to recognize the stars and constellations. You're watching Uncommon Ground. I'm West Blaze. God bless. Yeah. Scott Level Realm said, uh, no wonder why they don't talk about those things. Man, it, I'll tell you, when I was studying to put these that presentation together, I was trying to find scholars, you know, uh, doctors and, and people of prominence talking about how those are geocentric instruments. And they were out there. It was just yeah. hard to find them using the exact words. Sometimes they would say the earth is at the center in these instruments. But uh, that was the consensus about all of them. And, and they still work. That's the great thing, Sean. You can still use these things to determine the same stars that are fixed in their constellations that have not changed in all of recorded history. They are it seems pretty amazing to me. Um... Yeah, that would be in the future. If we had uh, more availability, that'd be a pretty awesome giveaway. You have an Astrolab away. Yeah, I want one for myself. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <that'd be right. laughs> I think they're like three, four hundred dollars, though, right? Um, Probably a nice. But one. I did. We had someone actually during the uh, in the chat just recently. They were asking about the firmament model we mentioned before that video. Sure. And they're asking, is it CGI or is it a true model? And it will be a true model. That's the whole purpose. It's going to be real construction. Um, we got a gentleman that's volunteering to help us with actual blueprints so that uh, someone else can go and try to build something like this because it's going to be detailed. And as you're, we, we kind of prefaced a little bit with our presentation last week that the firmaments, the multiple layers of the firmament, they, you know, these are not just single individual layers. There's things going on inside each layer. Yeah. So that's going to take some planning. <laughs> now, of course, the creator just did it all like, you know, a week, but it's going to take us a lot longer to plan out uh, all the different compartments and the different courses, the gateways, everything inside the multiple different layers. So it's like a three dimensional real live model and yeah. uh, it's going to be pretty, pretty amazing. So <laughs> and Mama Luberry, if the, if it's in the budget, it would be awesome one day to get like some 3d animation, get a 3d animator. Yeah. If y'all know of anybody that would love to help us and that has those kind of skills, we'd love to get some animation working too. AC is telling us to check out Marley Eugene. He's on the list guys. He's already on the list. We can't give away any spoilers though. Yeah, he actually invited <laughs> me to uh, take part in a debate with him here in the next couple of weeks, too. So stay tuned for that. But uh, yeah, we also want to have him on as a music guest because he does music as well. Yeah, he's talented as well. All right. Speaking of guests, um, I actually interviewed a pastor, Wes. Yeah. Yeah. And can... I, I asked him some general stuff about the scriptures. Um, I asked him some ferment questions. I asked him some creation questions and also like some geocentric style question as well. So um I'll, we'll let the audience uh, decide what they think about it. Play that clip, DJ. <laughs> All right, Matt, thank you for meeting me today. Yes. I really appreciate this. We just had lunch. It was a good lunch. We had a good talk about scripture, about faith, about our, our history growing up. Um, and I just want to thank you for, you know, all the service you do and, and laboring for the gospel, right? Which is essentially your head pastor of a church. Tell, you can tell us a little bit about your church. Or... Yeah, absolutely. Uh, New Life Assembly of God. And uh, we've been in, in existence for about 90 years. I've been pastor here about four years and God's doing some really cool things. So Awesome. 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 Yeah. So as I, as I talked to you about, we're, we're doing this new show called Uncoming Ground. And it's we're talking to people, not just believers, but also unbelievers. We're getting a perspective on all the different passages in the Bible that talk about creation. Now, some people have wildly different views on this topic, sure. you know, from, from Scripture. So in Genesis 1, it talks about the earth being created in six days. Do you think those are six literal days? Uh, I don't think those are six literal days. I think that uh, it's a it's a complex uh, supernatural situation that's that's uh, that's taking place there, and I think it's it's kind of beyond uh, really a a human limited uh, explanation. Oftentimes, gets oversimplified to fit into a Sunday school lesson, uh, but I, I don't necessarily think that uh, 
It was a six literal days. Do I think that God's uh, capable of uh, creating the earth in six literal days? Absolutely. Uh, but I don't know if that's necessarily uh, what's being described there. So, Okay. So then you ascribe to more of the um, the commonly taught model of there was a, an evolutionary process. Is it more like a theistic evolutionary idea where just things progressed over time, and, but God orchestrated it? Yeah, I, I I don't really have a, a set thing that I believe this is this is what I can uh, explain or describe. Uh, just that that what we what we see explained there and what we uh, have commonly given you know very simple this is what happened answers uh, is a is a you know really oversimplified human view of a supernatural thing that occurred. And so um, you know can can God put evolutionary processes into play and and certainly absolutely can god create something out of nothing absolutely certainly can uh whoa how was the the creation uh done exactly i think that's that's uh a lot of that to be determined uh okay. god knows uh and we we have a limited understanding of, of what that is so okay so in genesis 1 mm -hmm. in verses 2 through 8 where it talks about the spirit that hovered over the waters of the deep mm -hmm. And then it talks about in verse 68, this, this thing called the rakia in the Hebrew, this firmament, mm -hmm. as it's commonly translated into the English, that was created on day two and it separated the waters mm -hmm. that were, that we see in verse two. And then, so is that firmament thing, is that literal or figurative? Yeah. You've, you've done a lot more study on uh, the firmament than I have, uh, for sure, um, I, I don't have an answer to whether that was a literal or a, or a figurative uh, firmament. So, okay, all right. <laughs> um, so in in Genesis seven, in verse ten and eleven, mm -hmm. when the flood begins and the waters come, it says the floodgates of the heaven were opened, mm -hmm. and the waters came from above, and also the springs of the deep, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. came from the waters flooded from below. Where do you, what do you think that's speaking of? What do you think that's describing? Yeah, I. I've, I've read that and often scratched my head and, and asked that question. What, you know, what is this describing? How does this fit into, uh, into what we have? And it's, it's really not something that's ever, uh, gets addressed a whole lot or, or taught about a whole lot. Um, so I don't have a, a concrete answer that I would say I would uh, be willing to say this is, this is what happened, but it's certainly something that as you read that, that passage, uh, you know, it, it, uh, it definitely, doesn't line up with the neat little Sunday school lesson that we we're often taught. So, <laughs> yeah, okay, thank you. Um, so, in Matthew twenty-four, Jesus talks about mm -hmm. the, the, you know, the coming of the Lord. He mm -hmm. talks about him coming back, right? Or he sure. is the Lord, right? <laughs> so, in verses twenty-nine through thirty-one of Matthew twenty-four, he talks about the the stars of the earth of the of the sky, the stars falling to the earth. Mm -hmm. This is actually repeated. Yeah. And I, well, Yeshua, or Jesus is repeating what Isaiah 34, 4 already mm -hmm. says. But then this is later repeated again in Revelation 6, 11 through 14, that mm -hmm. the stars will fall to the ground. What do you think that's describing? Is that something literal? Are stars literally going to fall to the ground when at his second coming? Yeah. Uh, I, as we talked about in our, our conversation earlier, I think a lot of times equal to the creation, the uh, eschatological um, things that, that we see and we, we read is trying to wrap a, a human mind around, you know, something that happens, um, that's, that's supernaturally, that's beyond the realm of what we know and have seen, you know, the traditional view of that being rolled back. A lot of people just think, oh, well, just Jesus is going to kind of come from behind a cloud. Uh, but I think there's something more that's, that's, that's uh, taking place there, whether that, you know, those stars is, is, falling to the ground is, is figurative or, or literal. Um, you know, I don't know. Okay. Now I know that modern day, um, astronomy teaches that mm -hmm. we currently live on an earth with a circumference of 25,000 miles approximately. It's like 24, nine something. Mm -hmm. And that the, the sun is much larger than we are. And the moon is a quarter of our size mm -hmm. and that they're all at, at vast distances from us. And, it also says that, you know, that we are circling around the sun, but there's multiple verses in the scriptures that talk about the earth being stationary, never to be moved. And that the sun, specifically in Psalm 19, verses 4 through 7, 
the sun has its own circuits that it follows, and mm -hmm. it circles above us overhead inside the firmament. How, what do you think about when you hear that? What comes to mind? Yeah, um, you know, it, it doesn't match a lot of what we have and a lot of what we know and have been told. I think that uh, the Bible uh, can line up with science um, and that they're not as at odds as what people may uh have traditionally wanted you know that to be but i think what you have to realize as well is that from a scientific standpoint there's a lot of agendas behind what is taught and the theories that are explored and all those kinds of things and oftentimes if we're honest from from theological standpoints there are too there's agendas that are involved and so um you know you have to ask yourself what is what is the real science that there is and then what is what is uh, what does the Bible really say? And so I think yeah, doesn't Paul say something about uh, even in his epistle he talks about science falsely so called? Yeah, I mean it's, even back in his day he sure. was dealing with that. Right? Yeah, absolutely. And so I think I think that's that's a lot of what we what we deal with is certainly you know um, you know are, do you do you hold to that the, what the Bible has is is accurate and is is true and does it have to be at odds with science? What really do we know and what are the agendas behind the science that we ascribe to and, and all those kinds of things. And so, uh, yeah. And that's... is, you know, in Revelation 12, it says, uh, talks about the dragon, the one, you know, the serpent of old, the one called Satan. And that he, it says he deceives the whole world. Mm -hmm. Do you think science could be, or at least what modern day science purports, could be? an avenue for a tool for that deception over the whole world? Sure. I think, I think that can be, I think anything, anything can be, okay. um, you know, anything in the wrong hands, um, can be a tool that the, that the enemy uses can be a tool for, for deception and look, we're just a fallen world. And so, uh, whatever, whatever we, we use, um, you know, can be anything. It doesn't have to just be uh, that, but, the history that we tell um, yeah. this history can be used, um, you know, all, all kinds of things. We see it in our world today and it's a, uh, it's a, a counterfeit of, of the truth and it's a counterfeit of, of what reality is. And so, uh, it's good to, it's good to ask the questions and to explore and not just to say that, well, you know, that all science is, is wrong, but it's, it's just the way that you approach that science and, and those kinds of things. So. Okay. Well, thank you so much, yeah, Matt, for the absolutely. interview. This is a joy. I hope to see you again. Yeah, absolutely. Hallelujah. A lot of great questions you asked there, brother. Good yeah, content. Yeah, he's a good, good guy. We had good lunch. And what was interesting was I shared with him my beliefs prior to that interview. And uh, we talked for like a good hour, maybe a little over an hour at lunch and, and uh, just about my journey to faith, my journey to becoming a, you know, a guy with a YouTube channel talking about scripture all the time. And then suddenly this topic, how this topic came up and how it's changing people's lives. And like, like we even had some similar comments uh, while the video was playing about, you know, real science does lead to the validity of scripture. That's right. Yep. And that's, and that's exactly what it did for me. Yeah. And so many others. Yeah, yeah, for real. So like, it's this idea that when we're coming at this, um, you know, all scientific exploration and is built with it, with what's called a hypothesis, right? So they have this idea, they think something, then they'd look to go see, all right, if I can create the conditions of what I observe, will I get the same outcome within it, within some sort of measurable uh, field of outcome, right? Of expectation. So this yeah. is where they begin. What was simple was used to be simple with this, you know, this uh, scientific method, right? Mm -hmm. But now that the scientific method has been convoluted and complicated in the last 40 years, and they added yep. a whole bunch of steps to it that basically almost nullifies your original idea of just trying to prove a hypothesis with demonstration and observation. Right. But there's been a renaissance, Wes. There's been a revolution, if you will. We're people part of interested. that. We are. We're people like you and I. We, we want to do actual real science again, see an observation try to create similar or like-minded conditions to figure if you can't get a, you know, replicate and demonstrate the outcome. And so, yeah, I just, it gets me kind of jazzed up because there's so many people with the hive mind of the internet start talking about this topic. There's so many people that will start thinking in that way. And before you know it, that would be proven scripture left and right. Yeah. 
Absolutely. No more theoretical nonsense that we, you know, that contradicts what we observe in reality. So that's what we're after. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I actually, hope actually, you get, go ahead. No, go ahead, brother. Go ahead. Oh, I hope you get more opportunities. I've been praying to get more uh, pastors mm -hmm. and, and uh, people like that to be able to speak with. I actually got to speak with a quote unquote rabbi that was nice. uh, attending a Passover con, you know, um, congregation, a Passover get together that we had. And uh, we, we got a video coming up of that here in the second half of the show. So stay tuned for that. Yeah. In fact, you know, it's funny. I saw this, uh, this funny clip uh, pre recently, and I was thinking about this idea mm -hmm. of, you know, we're tonight, we're talking about a term that a lot of people in the scientific community are aware of this geocentricity, geocentricity idea, right? Because traditionally, whether people ascribe creation or not, they, they know this idea of heliocentricity or geocentricity, right? It's been a big mm -hmm. debate for a long time. Usually scripturally backed people stick with geocentricity because as we're going to show you and as we've already been showing you, these are observable, these are demonstrable. Heliocentricity, it takes a lot of faith to believe the stuff that's put forward, which is why in certain fields of heliocentristic teachings, they just say, trust us. And yeah. that's, you know, we're not going to go into every single field that does that right now. But uh, once you start studying it, specifically astrophysics, you start to realize, all right, these are theories that a dude that claims to be an authority says, trust my evaluation of this theory. That's right. So right now, though, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, my bad. It's, it's hard to call that science, though. That's more of what we would call scientism, in case you ever haven't ever heard that word. It's more of a faith based religion it is. than it is science. And uh, it's one that contradicts the word of God and his uh, his truth. So that's right. So, Wes, I saw this clip, uh, of, you know, uh, Christopher Walken. Yeah. You know, the actor. I saw this mm -hmm. clip and he's talking about uh, the idea of of uh, people of courage standing up. And that's what's happening. That's what we're doing with this show. We're being courageous to stand up for the scriptures. Um, we're being courageous to let people know that we're not going to put up with with uh, science falsely so-called any longer because we're seeing through the veil. We're seeing through the madness. We're looking behind the curtain and seeing someone operating, you know, uh, the wizard operating right. the thing behind the curtain. So it's just funny. I, just check this out. This is hilarious to me. So this is what I envision us doing right now. Uh, we're the lions. So one day that lion gets up, runs like the wind, eats everything in his path. Because every once in a while, the lion has to show the jackals who he is. <laughs> <laughs> we just want to be like Lion of Judah. That's right. That's right. I mean, ultimately, at the return of the Messiah, the lion shows the jackals who he is, right? He's, scared. He's going to route the wicked out of the earth. All this false knowledge that's perpetrated upon these generations that we had to weed through, like, to, like we're going to be showing you... Um, you know, hopefully real knowledge with the scriptures and then with, with our presentations in these, in these shows, but we have to weed through the bad information because that's what we've all been taught our whole life. So this is us standing up to the, the laughing hyenas because that's, that's right. what, that is the fruit that's produced from the heliocentric model. It's nothing but mockery. Mm -hmm. You try to challenge what they think and what they're teaching. They just mock you. Just add homonyms and insults yeah. flying left and right. Absolutely. I've yeah. So we're not going to do, we're not going to do that, wow. <laughs> but we have a, we have some scriptures we want to review. You want to get to those Wes? Yeah, absolutely. Let's bring that message full of the, the message of the truth in the world full of lies. All right. So let's go here. And so I think the first one we want to talk about was just Genesis one. Yeah. Last, last week we covered uh Genesis one kind of, two through eight and so this week we're getting to the uh the placement of the luminaries you want me to go first go ahead bro and god said let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth to divide to divide between day and night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven so as to show upon the earth and it was so and god made the two great lights the greater light for regulating the day and the lesser light for regulating the night the stars also and God placed them in the firmament of the heaven so as to shine upon the earth and to regulate day and night and to divide between the light and the darkness. And God saw that it was good. Hmm. Amen. It is. It is good. So we've got on. We got looks like just this next day here, day four. Right. We got the placement of the luminaries in the heavens above. Mm -hmm. We already talked about last week. There's multiple layers on the first day. There were six layers made. On the second day was the seventh and last layer that was created. And it was the one that encloses where we live in the earth plane. 
directly above our heads. Yeah. That's right. And so if he's yeah. putting the uh, these lights in the firmament, we talked about last week, these are physical structures. So it's it's not in the atmosphere. It's not in the uh, the clouds, as some people try to say the firmament is. And it's uh, it is in a physical domed vaulted ceiling of a structure that God called heaven. We got something in Jubilees, chapter two, verse eight through 11. It kind of uh, parrots that same idea, but it's a little bit extra depth of explanation. It goes on to say, and on the fourth day, he created the sun and the moon, and the stars and set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon all the earth and to rule over the day and the night and divide the light from the darkness. And God appointed the sun to be a great sign on the earth for days and for Sabbaths and for months and for feasts and for years and for Sabbaths of years and for Jubilees and all the seasons of the year. And it divides the light from the darkness and for prosperity, that all things may prosper, which shoot and grow on the earth. These three kinds he made on the fourth day. Wait, he, he made the sun as a sign for the Sabbath? He did. He did. The okay. sun and the moon. Yeah. Interesting. Pretty interesting, huh? Yeah. So, yeah, that's the Jubilees at uh, expounding upon Genesis 1. And then we also start getting into some more detailed information about the sun itself. You want this one? Psalm 19, verses 4 through 6 says, Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoices as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven, and his circuit unto the ends of it. And there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. So Hallelujah. stop me if I'm wrong, but does this say that his, the sun goes forth from the end of the heaven and his circuit is to the ends of it? Yeah. A circuit would be like a, uh, a, a circle where you start and come back to the same spot, right? Yeah. That's, that's a, that's also referred to as a course or a circumference. That's a circuit, like in, in a race circuit, you know, they, they race in mm -hmm. circles. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes the track is has bends and curves in it, but they always come back to that starting point. That's literally the definition of a circuit. That's interesting, and it's it is. From, from one end of the firmament, which is called the heaven. Mm -hmm. And yeah, because I was just about to say, yeah, we learned last week what that word heaven means. So when it says going forth, it's from the end of the firmament. So if it's <laughs> in this vaulted domed ceiling and it's going doing a circuit over our heads, obviously, then that would be a geocentric verse. It That's says right. it in plain detail to me right there, right there. Mm -hmm. You know, it's funny. Um, I think this is kind of repeated in Ecclesiastes one, five through six, where it says the sun also arises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it arose. We're actually going to talk about that in just a minute. The mm -hmm. wind goes toward the South and turns about to the North. It whirls about continually and the wind returns again, according to its circuits. We're yeah. going to talk about that wind too. The sun hastens to the place where he arose. Yep. So yep. Another telling of a circuit, yep. same kind of concept. And and there's a reason why the wind would go in a circuit as well mm -hmm. <laughs> in relationship to the sun rising and lowering. And we're going to explain all those pass all those concepts in this passage here in the next few minutes. Stick with us, guys. Also, cool. if you haven't already, be sure to hit the thumbs up button. Tag that bell for notifications. Um, don't don't subscribe. miss future episodes. Yeah, and subscribe if you haven't already. I mean, West Plays, you should be at 3,000 subs at this point, bro. If you're watching this, guys, subscribe. This is so you don't miss any future episodes. You're only gonna they're only gonna get better. So let's uh we'll check this out here in in first Ezra's 4, 33 and 34. Yeah, first Ezra's another book that used to be in the original King James 1611, still in other Bibles around the world. It says, Then the king and the princes looked one upon another. So he began to speak of the truth, not the lies, but the truth. And he says, oh, ye men are not women strong. Great is the earth. High is the heaven. Swift is the sun in his course, for he compasses the heavens round about and fetches his course again to his own place in one day. Saying the same thing. Same consistent message. Same thing. Yeah. And yeah. one single day he's making a circuit. He's court. He's running the course. He's going round about the, the firmament. Kind of like the picture right next to it. I'm on the slide here next to the verse, but sit now. Now we're going to get into some really fun stuff. Uh, not that this wasn't fun before, but <clears throat> the next few verses from Enoch that we're going to cover uh, gets us a lot more detail. I got to ask you a question first. You know, Sean, I've, I've heard of this guy, Enoch. I know who Enoch is. 
Yeah. But uh, this isn't the first time we're quoting from books that aren't included. You know, many people haven't heard of because they're, they haven't been in our Bibles for a long time in modern America. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Enoch has a book, too, but I haven't seen that in the in the Bibles that we often read. So if you had a press release statement for Uncommon Ground about why we would we would speak from these scriptures and, and say that they are scripture, what would you say? Well, first Enoch, not only having been validated in multiple canons across the world throughout history, um, on our channel, on Kingdom of Context, I actually done an entire breakdown of the manuscript history of the book of first Enoch and how it was accepted, not just from people before Yeshua's day, but also hundreds of years afterwards. Um, I, you know, I did a debate previously, um, Wes we talked about some of the quotes from early, you know, quote unquote church fathers, and they're all validating first Enoch as well as, you know, translators and scribes, they, they admit and acknowledge this was a part of Hebrew literature for a long, long time. Um, one of the most, or it's a, one of the books that was found in great abundance in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, the Ethiopians have had it in their canon for, I would suggest 2000 years from, from what history we can find out about it. And it's a, it's an amazing book that all of its prophecy passes the Deuteronomy 13 test and the Deuteronomy 18 test. And it, actually expounds and it is the foundation by which many of the prophecies in Zechariah, Isaiah, Revelation, Matthew, uh, even Yeshua quotes from a multitude of times. Um, it is the prophecies, like one of the baselines about all the return of, of the Messiah, the second coming, because there's so much of the return of the Messiah prophecy in the book of first Enoch. This is one of the ways that they would validate in future prophecies throughout the history of Israel when they would get all this information about the coming of the Lord. Well, that makes sense. They could just, oh, we've already heard Enoch talk about all this stuff before. Yeah, lots of messianic prophecy in Enoch. Yeah. Guys, if you haven't checked out First Enoch, definitely recommend it. Uh, Peter and Jude both definitely thought it was scripture because they're quoting mm -hmm. from concepts as well as our Messiah, quoting from lots of concepts that are only originated and introduced in the books of first Enoch Jubilees as well. Yeah. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. Pretty amazing. And so we got a couple passages from first Enoch where there's actually 10 full chapters about the luminaries in first Enoch, because Enoch is getting a, in a, in a vision, he's getting a tour, if you will, of all of creation through multiple different chapters. And it's fascinating because he's, you know, he gets more information than anyone, any other prophet I ever know. Yeah. I've never read any scriptures about what this, the, the creation is like. And here in 1st Enoch 69, he says, in 15 through 20, he says, And this is the power of this oath, for it's powerful and strong. And he placed this oath, okay, in the hand of Michael. And these are the secrets of this oath. And they're strong through this oath. The heaven, that's the firmament, was suspended before the world was created. That's day two, like we read last week. And forever. So through this, this oath that is a part of creation, that these rebellious angels are trying to get access to that Michael holds in some regard, right? It mm -hmm. was actually a part of what helped the, the power source, if you will, uh, that actually helped suspend the firmament before the actual earth was fashioned. It was just still in water, right? And it says, yeah. from the secret recesses of the mountains come beautiful waters from the creation of the world to eternity. And through that oath, the sea was created. And as its foundation, he set forth the sand against the time of, of its anger, and it dare not pass beyond it from the creation of the world into eternity. And through that oath are the depths made fast and abide and stir not from their place from eternity to eternity. Hey, Wes, does that sound like, um, it says doesn't stir. Does that sound like this is a maybe fixed and movable and firm, you know, foundation of the earth? Yeah, established on foundations like pillars. Sounds very familiar. So he goes mm -hmm. on to say, and through this oath, the sun and moon complete their course and deviate not and deviate not from their ordinance from eternity to eternity. Very good. Very fascinating, man. Lots of great stuff. Detailed stuff, too. Yeah, super detailed. First Enoch 69, 21 through 25 says, and and through that oath, the stars complete their course and he calls them by their names. And they answer him from eternity to eternity. And in like manner, the spirits of the water and of the winds and of all zephyrs and their paths from all the quarters of the winds. And there are preserved the voices of the thunder and the light of the lightnings. And there are preserved the chambers of the hail and the chambers of the hoarfrost and the chambers of the mist and the chambers of the rain and the dew. And all these believe and give thanks before the lord of spirits and glorify him with all their power and their food is in every act of thanksgiving they thank and glorify and extol the name of the lord of spirits forever and ever and this oath is mighty over them and through it they are preserved and their paths are preserved and their course is not destroyed 
Hmm. Amen. Yeah. So this is just more reinforcement to that. These what do you things, think? A, what do you think a zephyr is? If you don't mind. It's just a, it's an, exp, it's expounding upon the previous words where it says of all the winds, mm -hmm. uh, the zephyrs are, a, is another term, ancient term for winds and breezes. Is it interesting? Cause I yeah. know that in, um, ah, I forget when exactly, but early 1900s, they had some flying machines that they would call mm -hmm. zephyrs too. Yeah. So like blimps, different types of blimps. Yeah. yeah. They would call them zephyrs. Um, yeah. I mean, this is pretty amazing talking about the, the chambers of hoarfrost, the chambers of mist, the chambers of rain and dew. We see this like we read last week from Jubilees 2 2 when he's creating the firmament. He has chambers he put things into. We also see this in Job 38, I think it's verse 21 and 22, talking about the there chambers is. of the hail, the chambers mm -hmm. of the hoarfrost, things that he created intentionally, compartments inside the structure of the firmament, like we talked about last time. Enoch is is uh speaking about these things before Job was ever alive. Yeah. And there's some dew up there. That dew is preserved for a, a special kind of dew from what I've read in some other books like Second Baruch. Isaiah, yeah. I think, mentions it where it's uh, it's pre preserved and prepared for the resurrection. That's right. A kind of typology of baptism almost. That's right. The way I look at it. It's not regular Mountain Dew. There's no yellow five <laughs> in it. There's no caffeine, but it's that okay, life-given cool. dew. Yeah. Good. That's the one I need. <laughs> Get the... Yeah. Um <laughs> but this is fascinating little verses. This goes on to just, just, you know, just reminding people that this is all he's kind of going through a list of different things that have been created. He yeah. goes on in first Enoch 71 verses one through eight. Enoch expounds and says, it came to pass that after this, my spirit was translated. It ascended into the heavens and I saw the holy sons of God. Guys, he's having a vision. He, his body physically didn't go. This is how they describe having a vision. They were stepping on flames of fire. Their garments were white and their raiment. Their faces shone like snow. I saw two streams of fire and that. And the light of that fire shone like hasteneth. And I fell on my face before the Lord of Spirits. And the angel Michael, one of the archangels, he seized me by my right hand and lifted me up and led me forth into the secrets. He showed me all the secrets of righteousness. And he showed me all the secrets of the ends of the heaven and the chambers of all the stars and all the luminaries, where they proceed before the face of the holy ones. And he translated my spirit into the heaven of heavens. You guys remember last week we talked about multiple layers and the top layer was called the heaven of heavens. And I saw there as it were a structure built of crystals and between those crystals, tongues of living fire. And my spirit saw the girdle, which girt that house of fire, which that, you know, was round about that house of fire. And on its four sides were streams full of living fire. And then they girt that house and around about were seraphim and cherubim and the ophanim. And these are they who sleep not and guard the throne of his glory. And I saw angels who could not be counted a thousand thousands and 10,000 times 10 thousands encircling that house. Pretty yep. fascinating. That's what happens in the, uh, at the seven firmament on the top layer, correct? The heaven of yes. heavens. Heaven yeah. Hey, I had a, uh, I had a uh, special lady recently ask me what the, the tongues of fire were when we were reading that. And the only thing I could think of was Acts two when Pentecost was happening. Spirit came down. Yeah. Tongues of fire were like, were, were they over their heads or what, what is that? How does that look? I, you know, from what I can understand, there's angels in Enoch for Eden of chapter 19 and other places that are actually described as fire. And then when they choose, they can become in the form of a man. They can change into the form of a man. Mm. So I always theorize Acts 2. It's literally, it's literally angels coming down. But wow. Okay. But so it's from the sake of. of yeah, like very practical, not like just it's not like a movie where there's like magic fire that just hovers over you. But it'd be like an actual, you know, being just like in uh, Genesis 11, where Yahweh says to the angels, come, let us go down and confuse their language. Well, maybe he sent angels down to straighten up there or give them the ability to talk in other languages. There it in is, this moment, you know, in tongues. Right. Very yeah. interesting. Very cool yeah. stuff. I like it. Yeah. yeah and that word, flame and fire. Yeah. And it just makes me wonder, like, you know, the the, the description from. The translator just inserting Tons. yeah if you don't know what uh enoch has described as angels being a flame of fire you know and looking like that um same thing i did an entire breakdown on ezekiel's wheels with the same i was just about to say that yeah yeah the wheel thing, opening <laughs> yeah just like we read here in this chapter it talks about these three types of angels around the throne of god at the at the top layer the firmament the seraphim tribune and ophanim well that word ophanim is is the core root word that's being used in, in multiple passages of Ezekiel, specifically chapter one and modern day translators just translated as wheels, but that's, you know, he's, <laughs> it's right next to cherubim and seraphim in the same passage, which, you know, if the translator never read Enoch before, then he's going to look at the word Ophan, which is the Hebrew word for wheel, something that, and not technically even a wheel, but something that spins. And he could easily get confused by thinking, because he's never seen the word Ophanim before, because he's never read the book of Enoch. That's and right. so, 
just little stuff like that. I think translators, you know, sometimes this is why, uh, you know, in the study guide that I'm creating, Wes, I, I actually have little places where I say, look for translator insertions. So that it hopefully prompts the reader to go and like dig up the original word and look to see if, because translators, you know, they don't, they don't always know any better. I mean, just because you can translate the, you know, the, the word, the English Hebrew, word Greek. for shirt, you know, yeah. you could translate that into another language. That doesn't mean that you know how to place it in a paragraph or a sentence. You have to know the context of the story. Yeah, there it is. That's right. So, yeah. Interesting stuff. Thank yeah, you. It's very, uh, very important. So we got, you know, an, an amazing concept here. Uh, First Enoch 71, all the chambers of the stars, the chambers of the luminaries, and how they proceed from the face of the holy ones. That's going to be the angels that are in charge over them. We're going to be reading about them a little bit more in just a minute. Very cool. This is me. 1 Enoch 72, 2 through 5 says, and this is the first law of the luminaries. The luminary of the sun has its rising in the eastern portals of the heaven and its setting in the western portals of the heaven. And I saw six portals in which the sun rises and six portals in which the sun sets. Twelve altogether there. And the moon rises and sets in these portals and the leaders of the stars and those whom they lead. Six in the east and six in the west and all following each other in accurately corresponding order. Also, many windows to the right and left of these portals. And first there goes forth a great luminary named the sun, and his circumference is like the circumference of the heaven. And he is quite filled with illuminating and heating fire. The chariot on which he ascends, the wind drives, and the sun goes down from the heaven and returns through the north in order to reach the east, and is so guided that he comes to the appropriate portal and shines in the face of the heaven. It's all mm. about the sun there later on. Interesting. Mm -mm. So, guys, imagine you're <clears throat> underneath a dome, and above you, the sun is spinning above your head. And so, this he's trying to explain the circumference of the sun is like the circumference of the heaven. If you guys meaning it's course can see my finger, yeah, circumference, <laughs> right? That means a circular path, the circuit, mm -hmm. like we talked about earlier, and that it is driven by winds. Remember what we read in First Ecclesiastes chapter one, verse five through six, that the winds also follow their course and their circuit into heaven and they're the, right behind the sun. That's, yeah. This is what Enoch, this is where the Jeremiah who wrote Ecclesi uh, Ecclesiastes, so to speak. So most people believe um, this, this would be where that writer would get that information since he's not declaring, thus says the Lord, I prophesy something. Instead, he's describing something to attribute at, uh, beauty and, and love to the Lord in his lament. So, in fact, real quick, before we move too much further, we had someone in the in the chat, Wes, who said, um, this is Gregory Soller, and he's asking, when you guys get a chance, it'd be beneficial to hear how creation reveals God's righteousness. Well, that's actually what we're reading from First Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 5 through 6, where he's expounding on the creation as he's about to explain the righteousness of the Father and how he was just in having them scattered and in an exile in Babylon. So this is and this is very interesting um, that first Ecclesiastes is all of the creation model that we're expounding and, and telling you all of it continues to say over and over none of these things are going to be changed these are these are eternal ordinances the sun moon and stars their courses in the heaven they will not be changed um, like in Joshua they may have a temporary delay one day but they're not going to be he's not going to reorganize the model. He's not going to change it in any capacity. He made what he made. He, he was, he knew exactly what he wanted to make and he made caveats for it to move, you know, how we wanted to. And he says, it's eternal. Like we read last week, there's an eternal um, agreement between the sun and the moon and how the creator made them where they're not going to overrun each other. They're not going to, you know, mess with the, you know, they're They're in this constant balance with each other. And uh, so all of it proves the father's righteousness, in my opinion, Wes, because, you know, the father's righteousness means his his good, consistent, faithful, eternal, loving behavior. So he literally exemplified that in his creation. Yeah. Well, to me, righteousness is, you know, what is right? Obviously, it's it's uh, defined for us in Deuteronomy 625, but we get uh, an idea of what is right. And God's righteousness is the utmost of what is right. And it was absolutely the most right thing to do for us and for our sake to create as he created everything that he created. He's got this perfect plan in mind and he knows what he made and, uh, and how to make it so that it would suit all the, the cycles of nature and uh, be able to, to be a, a, a habitable zone for us for many centuries and millennia to come. That's right. So it's, yeah, I think we're, 
hopefully all these verses are exemplifying the righteousness of our father, our heavenly father uh, here later down in first Enoch 72, he goes on to finish up real quick. He says, mm-hmm. this is the law and the course of the son. His return as often as he returns 60 times and rises. We're going to explain the rising in the setting that was just mentioned in this entire chapter real quick. Just miss stick with us guys. Mm-hmm. The great luminary, which is named the sun forever and ever uh, again, West, there it is right there. He's saying the sun's not going away. Right. That which was this rises is the great luminary, and so is named according to its appearance, according as the Lord commanded. As he rises, so he sets. Now, now Wes, does he? What does this mean? Is this is this the sun coming up over our horizon and then setting again in the west over a horizon? No, I think it's more of actually moving forth. That's right. Yeah. We're going to go over the different words that expound upon the, you know, the movement, but also we're going to go over the description. What we just read the description from earlier part, you know, first 70, 172, excuse me. Um, and I hope you guys caught it. Cause we're going to, you know, try to expound with a little video here in a minute to show you that as it's circling overhead in the firmament above you, it's moving up and down and you can see this. I'm going to show it to you on film. With the 24th so, sun, yeah. Just like it says, it, it it's going through the different, you know, northeast, west, south, it's going through the different parts of the heaven that are labeled in the four four quarters of the heaven. And as it goes through the north to rise back up to the east. So you know, according to we can film this and we can see in its daily circumference and its daily spin above our head, um, it's gonna be going and, and the, the video that I found west is actually from the North Pole. Cool. Or at least the most northern region. So basically, he can take a 24-hour video in 360-degree fashion. Mm-hmm. And he can see the the rising and the setting of the sun inside of its course in that for that particular day. It's pretty fascinating. And, and it like breathes to a rhythm almost, right? That's right. Yeah, that's right. Mm-hmm. So he goes on to say, so that which is rises is the great luminary, and so is named according to its appearance, according to as the Lord commanded. As he rises, he so he sets and decreases not and rests not. Right. It, it never takes a day off and turns the light off. Right. <laughs> but he runs day and night and his light is sevenfold brighter than that of the moon. But as regards in size, they are both equal. So sevenfold this, brighter. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, and it's it's directly telling you right here. The sun is not, you know, a million sizes of the earth and it's not greater than the moon. That the moon is actually the same size as the sun. This is what the, the creator of all just, things. Just as they appear. With our it's own observation. Just, yeah, exactly. <laughs> How it, This is one of those uh, those moments where the heliocentric model that mankind has concocted truly exemplifies the idea that man just wants to overcomplicate simple stuff. Yeah. And to disagree with God, I think, yes. predominantly. Yeah, which is this, their descent into madness. Mm-hmm. So and here you we said go. a second ago real quick, you said that the sun and the moon uh, aren't going anywhere. So we hear a lot of people kind of interpret when Revelation says that the New Jerusalem has no need for the sun and the moon because of the brightness of the, the father and, and the son who are both there together. Uh, then, you know, just because it says that it has no need and that their brightness shines and illuminates the city, it doesn't mean that the sun and moon aren't also still a thing because they are. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, real quick, next chapter, a couple verses here from first Enoch 73. It says, after this, I saw another law dealing with the smaller luminary, which is named the moon. Her circumference is like the circumference of the heaven and her chariot in which she rides is driven by the wind and light is given to her in definite measure. Isn't it true that the word, the Hebrew word for wind can also mean spirit? That's right. That's right. Cool. Yeah, this is where I would like to. I looked at um, the, there's two different major translations of the first Enoch. One's written by uh, uh, Lawrence and the other one's by Charles. Mm-hmm. Uh, for example, like there's even someone in the audience. He's like, isn't that supposed to be first Enoch 74 or whatever, but or 72, 45 to 47. And you you may be the reason why you may be asking that, brother, is because you're reading from uh, I was taking this from Charles. You may be reading it from Lawrence. They're slightly different in the placement of the verses. Still the same information. And yes, I tried to look that up because, yes. Angels are called winds at times and they're called spirit at times, but both translations call it a wind. And yeah. uh, I think it's interesting because we are going to read about how angels are involved in this process anyway. So um, yeah, it reminds me too of when our, our Messiah says, uh, talking about the resurrection, when he says, you must be born again of water and spirit. He says uh, that you'll be able to move like the wind. The wind comes right. and goes, you don't know where it blows. That's right. And of course, this is referencing the moon, same circumference, just like the sun. That means it's circular over your head. This is 100% geocentricity being espoused by the scriptures. And it goes on to say, uh, do you want this one, brother? Sure. 
First Enoch 75, three through five says, for the signs and the times and the years and the days, the angel Uriel showed to me whom the Lord of glory hath set forever over all the luminaries of the heaven and uh, in the heaven and in the world that they should rule on the face of the heaven and be seen on the earth and be leaders for the day and the night the sun, moon, and stars, and all the ministering creatures which make their revolution in all the chariots of the heaven. In like manner, 12 doors Uriel showed me, open in the circumference of the sun's chariot in the heaven, through which the rays of the sun break forth, and from them is warmth diffused over the earth. When they are opened at their appointed seasons, and for the winds and the spirit of the dew, when they are opened, standing open in the heavens at the ends so it said 12 doors is that the same the same six quote-unquote portals we just read about where the sun goes through to, to rise and to set that's right yep. cool yep yeah it's uh and this is i love that you point out the idea that synonymous is wind and spirit because right here it talks about the for the winds and the spirit of the dew yeah because we talk there's like all these angels that have been assigned places in this firmament for all these different functions to make sure they're functioning as they should. So that's why you'll see that the spirits that are constantly referenced in relationship to the, to the luminaries and the other things that are up there. So I'm reminded amazing. of a, uh, you know, how clockwork, you know, you got all these intricate gears, all these moving pieces, all the, the hands that depict the time and kind of the seasons and stuff too. Right. But every now and then those will need a little bit of maintenance. You got to take it to the clock guy and he's going right. to help tune it up and make sure it's running properly. And that's, God, God knows that when he creates something physical in a fallen world, that it can kind of have effects, especially from sin, and that uh, he has his clock workers and, and maintenance men making sure everything's running right. right. And, and that's cool to me. That's right. Because he talks about it right here at the top of this verse you read, he's seen on the earth and be leaders for the day and the night, the sun, moon, star, all the ministering creatures that which make their revolution in all the chariots of the heaven. Yeah. So I think that's fascinating. We're actually it goes on to talk about this further and for the verses six through nine it says, as for the 12 portals in the heaven at the ends of the earth, which out of which go forth the sun, moon and stars and all the works of heaven in the east and in the west. There are many windows open to the left and right of them. And one window at its appointed season produces warmth corresponding as these do to the doors from which the stars come forth, according as he has commanded them and wherein they set corresponding to their number. I saw chariots in the heaven running in the world above those portals. We're going to go over the word portal here in just a minute, guys, in which revolve the stars that never set. And one is larger than all the rest. And it is that that makes its course through the entire world. Beautiful. Very interesting. Very well interesting. said. So, it is. First Enoch 78, one through three. And the names of the sun are the following. Uh-oh. <laughs> the first, or Jaris. Or 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 Her Yaris? I, I have know. no idea. And the, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> and the second, Tomas. And the moon has four names. The first name is Asanya, the second Ebla, and the third Benase, <laughs> and the fourth Ere. These are the two great luminaries. Their circumference is like the circumference of the heaven, and the size of the circumference of both is alike. Talking about the sun and moon, the yeah. orbs are of equal size, right? Yeah, that's right. And uh, yeah, it's a good job on the word on the names. I have no clue how to say those. But <laughs> again, it just reinforces this idea that they have a circumference. Obviously, we can see them, but it's literally comparing this the uh, circular shape of these of these luminaries that you can see with the firmament that was made. Hmm. If you wonder what the shape and size of the why the translators would call in Amos 9, 6, the firmament, a vaulted dome because that has a circumference shape, right? It does, a circular yeah. sitting over the circle of the earth. That's right. So here in First Enoch verse eight, uh, chapter 80, verse one, it says, and in those days, the angel Uriel answered and said to me, behold, I've shown you everything, Enoch, and I've revealed everything to you that you should see the sun and the moon, the leaders of the stars of the heaven. That's talking about the angels, guys. We didn't have time to put all the, all the chapter, 10 full chapters, go read them yourself. But he later actually gets the names of the guys who are in charge of the sun. Making sure it's following its courses and going through these gates and, yeah. and the portals. So it, it says the leaders of the stars of the heavens and all those who turn them, their tasks and their times and departures. So Enoch's getting not just like, it's kind of like, Ural's kind of like take Enoch to work day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> Ural is at work. He's in charge of all these angels that that uh, are 
watching over the luminaries and how they move. So this is why Uriel is talking to Enoch in this moment. Yeah. Or take Enoch's spirit to work day, rather. Yeah, take Enoch and a vision to work day. Yeah. <laughs> cool. So what's cool though is I just want to sh- for anyone that's interested in a little bit deeper study, a little bit deeper dive, we put forward these ideas of the words used in the in the scriptures. Um, when it talks about the the sun going down or the sun mm-hmm. going and setting. So many times this word in the strong uh, uh the Hebrew word for it's strong 3996, and that's the word mabo, and it's an entrance or a coming in or an entering. Okay. So it doesn't mean going down hmm. like we think in the, in the English, right? That's where the stuff gets quote unquote lost in translation. So the actual Hebrew word just means if, if you were to try to put it in the verse right above in Psalm 104, 19, it would say his appointed, he appointed the moon for seasons. The sun knows where it's coming in or where it's entrance is. It's interesting. Cause it's like the opposite of what the word means. Cause going down, right. I think of setting going away. Yeah. Well, this is, <laughs> this is why we're going to show this video in a minute that shows just as we read from first Enoch 72, where the sun rises and the sun sets as it circles above in the sky. Yeah. So it's not talking about going over the curve. There is no curve. It's not talking about that. It's talking about how it's moving inside its course inside the layer of the firmament that it's set in. So uh, we also have in Psalm 19, 6, the same idea. Um, his going forth is from the end of the heaven and his circuit is unto the ends of it. There's nothing hid from the heat thereof. That word for going forth is uh, Strong's in the Hebrew 4161 is a place or an act of going forth, an issue, an export, a source or a spring. Hmm. It's this word uh, mota. So it doesn't mean that it's... Um, rising or setting literally right and this is actually the kjv but other translations will say it's rising or it's setting is from one end of the heaven to the other it just means going forth like in the right. in course and its circumference yeah, it's, around it's, the heavens it's travel it's traveling forward right yeah. as we just read in first enoch it doesn't mean over. that it's, it's going over a curve or behind, you know rising right. over the edge of the earth so yeah. And if yeah. we've been looking for, I've been looking for four or five years. If anybody knows of any evidence or examples of earth curvature, please send them to uncommon ground email at gmail.com. Yep. That'd be great. Please. Pretty amazing. <laughs> you know, I, uh, I'm, I'm in the Colorado area. Okay. And Pikes Peak is one of the biggest mountains on the front range in Colorado. It's, it's near uh, Colorado Springs, just south of Denver, about 45 minutes. And it's, it's a, what they call a 14 er So it's over 14,000 feet tall massive mountain you can see it all the way where i where i lived in the area of fort collins i could literally see it in the city of fort collins at a specific stoplight at ground level and sitting in my car through the trees on a very clear day at six in the morning i could see pike's peak which was let me see it from it's 60 miles to denver and then another 45 105 miles away yeah not just the top i could see the entirety of it that's right so like, that's crazy guys. That should be hidden even at 14,000 feet. I shouldn't even see the peak of it. Cause it should be hidden over, you know, a mile or two of, of curvature. Yeah. So, they say eight inches per mile squared. Yeah. And so in, in one mile, that's, that just happens to be eight inches is 0.666 of a foot. I don't know if you knew. So in 10 miles, that's 66.6 feet of curvature in a hundred miles. There should exist 6,669 feet of curvature. And I kid you not, they say that the earth is tilted at 23.4 degrees. If you subtract that from a right angle of 90 degrees, you sit, you get 66. 6.6 degrees and then you can look it up I, I don't make this up i wish i could they say the earth is spinning around the sun at 66,600 miles per hour that's Why? crazy yeah it's just yeah, all over it's written all over it <laughs> very convenient math very convenient math. <laughs> um sherry cox says she lives in loveland that's just south of, of the place i was talking about so yeah. she probably can see it on a clear day as well oh and also sherry i've been to cheyenne and i can see long's peak from cheyenne crazy crazy i used to there's, live in copper no mountain furniture. yeah i used to live in copper mountain not far from there oh yeah that's yeah, cool for a little while that's cool um real quick question have you ever heard of this wes i haven't heard any donna flint is asking how do you explain the videos of birds or planes going through the sun if it's inside of a firmament structure so the the videos that we see you know optical illusions can happen with the the brightness of light if things pass in front of it the light depending on like you know your whatever optic you're viewing it through even with your own eyes this can happen um that something passing in front of a really bright light the light just kind of 
like what's the word just overcomes the object in front of it according to the optics and so it looks as if it's going into the sun through the sun it's just the uh optical illusion that the light creates as far as i can tell the same thing with clouds you know as as uh, somebody that's aware of the biblical cosmology uh creation we see a lot of people that uh, will share these different memes and images. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of people sharing images of, of what looks to be sun uh, clouds behind the sun or yeah. the sun in the clouds. And I would propose that the, the highest clouds are on record to only be about 50 miles high and right. uh, that the sun should probably be quite a bit higher than that, I would imagine. Well, we see the sun is higher than that when you have high altitude balloons that go mm -hmm. up and film at 100,000 feet and the sun is yeah. still above them. Above the clouds. And, and, right. and they're above, and that, that video being filmed is above the clouds. Mm -hmm. um, and this, yeah, I've seen those too. I, I think a lot of people forget, Wes, that in the clouds, you have actual water content being held at either microscopic levels or a little bit greater than it gets too heavy and it falls. So you got so, refraction. And yeah, you've got, this is where you get the idea of a silver lining of a cloud. There's there's water inside, there's saturation inside these cloud um, wisps, if you will. And that will reflect light in certain areas and others it won't. It will create uh a sense of shining, which is what the refraction West said as well. So like, this is why, you know, you can have sunlight at the bottom of a cloud, even though it's setting and the, and the sun is still above it, because that just means the light's going through the cloud and you can see it at that point. And there's water saturation throughout the rest of the cloud that's darker. And so you can't see it at that point because it's your perspective, your view. And it just depends on which part of the cloud is saturated with water that's blocking the light and which is letting it through. So it's very simple. Right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, but real quick, we we'll get back to this. Uh, just as a, in the Greek, guys, I just want to show here in Acts 10, 17, it, there's a use of the Greek word gateway. And this is all the word is from the, you know, uh, Lawrence's translation. Also, uh, um, I'm, I'm going blank. Um, Charles, 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 Charles's translation. They're both translating from the Greek. And Charles is the one that actually did a companion comparison with the Ethiopic as well. So both of the translations of Enoch are from the Greek. They, you see this word portal, like we read in those passages multiple times, the sun's going through these portals. Um, the winds go through these different portals above the sun. Well, that's just a Greek word for gateway, guys. And I got it here on screen for you. It's used in the New Testament and the Greek as well. It's very simple. Uh, Pulan, we got another example of it. Um, so do you mean like a, a, a stargate, like one of those science fiction <laughs> things that you walk through and it's like a... No, no, no. It's just the, another use of the Greek word is, is for the word door. And that one oh, also okay. can mean an entrance or a portal, just like you read in the Hebrew where it said that that Hebrew words were entrance. So like it's just thing. an opening in a solid something. Yeah. So imagine, guys, there's angels up there. And according to the different seasons, as the, you know, the as Jubilees tells us, there's 91 days in each quarter of the year, each season of the year. And we see actually these. According to First Enoch, these angels are responsible for opening these gates in the ferment for the sun to go through at these appointed times in the transitions of the seasons. So that's pretty amazing to me. And, and I'm interested, actually, um, uh, Wes, as far as people's observations and when they see sun anomalies, it makes me wonder if that's the day they're seeing it is these days going through these portals, these gates. Could be. Just just a thought. I'd love to do some experiment in the future. Um it, it says that it's it specifically traverses through those when it sets and rises, right? Well, not, I, I was talking about on a, on a quarterly fashion throughout the year, but you're right. It also goes through individual gates as it goes in south okay, and rises okay. east and west. We actually now. have a quick little video here to show you what we're talking about, guys. I put some bars on the screen so you can see how the sun is rising and setting. Setting doesn't mean going behind the curvature. It just means it's rising and lowering in the firmament as it's making its circle overhead. Here's a quick ex explanation. And first, there goes forth the great luminary, named the sun, and his circumference is like the circumference of heaven, and he is quite filled with illuminating and heating fire. The chariot on which he ascends, the wind drives, and the sun goes down from the heaven and returns through the north in order to reach the east, and is so guided that he comes to the appropriate portal and shines in the face of heaven. And this is the first law of the luminaries. The luminary, the sun, has its rising in the eastern portals of the heaven, and its setting in the western portals of the heaven. It's a great visual, Sean. And so it's something interesting about that 24-hour sun. It can be viewed from the North Pole, but mm -hmm. we've had some... 
what do you call them hoaxes of the 24-hour sun so-called in the antarctic at the quote-unquote south pole because uh, and you can even see in those videos when they try to say it's a 24-hour sun from antarctica they'll do cuts there'll be right. you know there'll be split screens and stuff and uh i think the favorite the reason- one i saw was the flag shadow Okay. Did you guys see? Yeah. Do you see that one where they're trying to you. that flag shadow disappeared for eight hours? Because mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's light still, but the sun. That's right. That's right. Because you couldn't, if you're thinking about it, you'd have to look at the map really. Because if you're on the outside, there's no one point at which you'd be able to follow the sun from 24 hours when it does the path it does going That's around right. the outside like that. You'd have to be able to run all the way around the earth, and it's impossible. So, right. uh, but at the north, you can see it, and so to me, that's a proof of. The creation model that that's there right. is no 24 hour sun in antarctica no true 24 hour sun we don't have any actual true film of it that hasn't been clearly doctored to show it and so um and by the way there's a lot of people that that do work at military bases in, in antarctica mm-hmm. and they have to sign non-disclosure agreements to what they see and hear and do i believe it they actually do uh there's a uh, wait i've heard interviews when i'm telling you we, that'll be a new show in the future but the antarctica show the antarctica <laughs> yeah we could talk about that in the future you want to like the ice wall yes sir psalm 93 one and this is from the lxx and anytime you see that guys that is uh a shorthand for the septuagint the greek septuagint great stuff too check that out and it says for the day before the sabbath when the land was first inhabit- inhabited the praise of a song by david the lord reigns he has clothed himself with honor. The Lord has clothed and girded himself with strength, for he has established the world which shall not be moved. Is there another way to take that? I don't know how else to. to <laughs> is there what it, would there be like a metaphoric way to say, oh, that doesn't that doesn't really mean that the earth doesn't move? I, I can't even think of one. <laughs> I, I can't either. I can't. Because when people say, oh, it's just poetry. Well, what what do you imagine yeah. that it's poetry for? Like, what is it trying to say? <laughs> There's no relatable idea. In heliocentricity, they say not only is this is the sun moving, it's spinning around the, the sun. It's revolving around the sun and it's flying through space uh, and, and spinning in a galaxy in the solar system. I mean, like it's, it's going in like three different axes of motion. So it's actually moving lots and lots as, a per, as opposed to be firm, established, never to be moved. And in the heliocentric model, uh, specifically the secular heliocentric model, the earth is destined for a heat death when our sun goes supernova in 200,000 years. So therefore it would be moved as it just, it dies and is destroyed. M- mainstream churches that have picked up this idea of evolutionary theology, which is what I referenced with my interview with the pastor earlier, where they claim that the, um, the earth is just all this ev- evolution stuff is true, but yet it's just God who helped do it. Right. Yeah. God that orchestrated the evolution. They also, will fall into the idea of, oh, well, if the solar system goes away, that could be what God was talking about when he says, I'll make a new heaven, a new earth. But again, Wes, how does that work? All these verses we're reading and we're about to read more says that the, 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 the earth doesn't, isn't going to be moved ever. Yeah. Or removed. Or, re- right. or removed. That's right. <laughs> Psalm 104, he says, who laid the foundations of the earth that it should never be moved forever. That's right. Removed. <laughs> it, that's where it says removed. There you go. <laughs> Psalm 75, 3. The earth and all who dwell in it melt. It is I who have firmly set its pillars. Selah. So now, not only is it firmly set, but it has pillars. Mm-hmm. Interesting. And, and everybody in it will melt. So you remember last week, uh, Wes, we talked about this structure of the firmament that mm-hmm. was you know, six layers were made on day one, on day two, the seventh layer was made encompassing and enclosing the earth where we live. And I was like, this is a structure guys. This is a house with multiple levels and we're just living at the bottom. Well, every house has foundations. Mm -hmm. So we have references to foundations here that pillars that have been firmly set, just like you would set with the building. Yeah. Cause there's even a parable about if you lay a house on unsolid foundation, you know, it's That's not right. as good as if you lay it on a solid foundation. <laughs> Job 34 says, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Yes, Job 38, 4. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. He laid that foundation, set it and established it firm, fixed it fast. There's there's dozens and dozens. These are just a few of the verses that show, you know, and, and I'm of the opinion that God only should really have to say something once for it to be true. Right. But uh, he, he really goes overboard and makes sure we... We have the point driven home for us that it is immovable. Yeah. Here's another Some... reference to its pillars trembling uh, whenever the creator gets mad. Um, and that's going to actually, I, I think that that verse refers to the coming of the Lord personally, but it's still using the creation model to expound upon eschatology, which is to me, that seems like a really important detail. 
Yeah. Another one here. First Chronicles 1630. Tremble before him all the earth. The world is firmly established and it cannot be moved. Cannot be moved. Cannot. Cannot. So it says in Sirach 46, 3 through 4, who before him ever stood so firm? For he waged the wars of the Lord. Was not the son held back by his hand and did not one day become as long as two? What's this talking about, brother? Joshua 10. Yeah, this is Sirach. It's also called Ecclesiasticus. And I think this is interesting because as far as I'm aware, this is the only passage that tells you exactly how long maybe the, the sun and moon stood still. In Joshua 10, it says one day became as long as two. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So we have that, of course, you know, in Joshua 10, 12 to 14, if anyone's ever read it, this was the moment they were fighting the five kings, and the Amorites. They needed some more daylight to finish up the battle. Joshua prays standing in the valley and literally the, both the sun and the moon. So not just the sun, but the sun and the moon stopped their course. Mm -hmm. So in a heliocentric model, how, how would you foresee this possibly taking place? No, it seems like as if he would have said that the earth stopped spinning, if that were the case. Right. You know, instead of saying that the sun and moon stopped. So if the moon is related to the tides of the ocean, which is not true, but that's what we're told. How do you think that would have been affected if them suddenly we just stopped moving? And what what does that mean? What does that mean? Like, how does how does the supposed gravitational pull from the moon now affect the earth if we stop spinning and there's no uniformity? <laughs> so, what is going on? Are we Massive just, tsunamis. Just like just like a big bulge of water just starts getting pulled off the earth for 10 to 12 hours in, in somewhere crazy. out in the South Pacific. Like it yeah. just makes no sense, guys. Yeah. It makes it makes no sense. It really doesn't. I'm actually of the opinion that the sun and moon do carry what we saw where the winds follow them. They do carry some sort of an electromagnetic wake mm -hmm. of sorts, which sure. I would imagine can affect the tides. What do you yeah. think? Yeah. Yeah. A mixture of uh the electromagnetism that, that we talked about in the first episode. Not only can it affect the air, but as well as the winds, and 100% agree that has a an outward effect and also would affect the tides, because we have tides that go different directions on different coastlines all across the world. It doesn't make sense for spinning. No. It doesn't make sense. It's, it's that that it's not how science uh, works. So we actually have uh, some unique quotes here. One's from Martin Luther. Yeah. Can I read this one? Martin sure. Luther there. He was alive from 1483 to 1546 AD. And somewhere in the midst of that, he was dealing with uh, Copernicus in that situation. And so where there is talk of a new astrologer, Nicholas Copernicus, who wants to prove that the earth moves and goes around instead of the sky, the sun, the moon, just as if somebody were moving in a carriage or ship might hold that he was sitting still and at rest while the earth and the trees walked and moved. But that is how things are nowadays. When a man wishes to be clever, he must invent something special. And the way he does it must needs be the best. The fool wants to turn the whole art of astronomy upside down. However, as Holy Scripture tells us, so did Joshua bid the sun to stand still and not the earth. Mm. So 1500s, we got Martin Luther calling out Nicholas Copernicus for his invention of heliocentricity. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So guys, I know, you know, sometimes when we read stuff from, from people third, you know, three, 400 years ago, the, the language is a little bit different, you mm -hmm. know, it seems a little different, but we have a, a modern version of Martin Luther's reaction to Nicholas Copernicus. I think it means poppycock. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, just, humor. <laughs> yeah, just in case you didn't understand what we just read, that's all he's saying. He didn't believe Nicholas Copernicus. He was like, this goes against everything we can observe. So that's that's all it means. Um, we also have a, a unique little thing here from Plato, and he used this unique word that's translated. Uh, I don't know the, how to say the original Greek word from Koinonia Greek uh, West, but I do know how to say the Latin word that it was translated from, which is Imperion. And it's unique because the definition of this word is actually used for uh, the highest heaven. So here's hmm. Plato using a word referencing multiple layers of firmament even in his day, 500 BC, or excuse me, four, fourth century BC. And it's uh, talking about this Imperion is, is uh, in the cosmological model that they all believed in. It was a, a, a word that later everyone understood as it was the firmament. He's talking about the firmament even back then. This is a yeah. Greek philosopher, guys. That's right. Him and Aristotle both, you may have heard from my video near the opening of the show that uh, they were both proponents of geocentrism. And so this guy apparently also understood that there were structures above our heads, multiples. Multiples. Yep. Um, and real quick, guys, we just want to show you, uh, you know, we're, we're talking about 
geocentricity on this episode, showing you scriptural proof. We're showing you little physical observation that validates what the scriptures have been describing this whole time. But the world teaches something different. They're teaching heliocentricity, totally different. And they equate advancement of progress of science and culture. They equate institutions of learning all to the validity built upon heliocentricity, which is built upon an evolutionary model. Yes, people will say, well, Sean, Charles Darwin didn't come along to the 1800s. Evolution does not do theocentricity. Not true. They equate the two systematically as a part of their religion intimately together. And if you disagree with either part, he, evolutionary or heliocentricity, they think that you're not worthy to be uh, alive, I'll be honest with you. But they, they let's, let's listen to some of the um, modern day high priests of this religion talk about how they think this religion should be enforced across the world. It amazes me that people have pre-existing notions that defy the evidence of reality, but they, that they hold on to them so dearly. And one of them is the notion of creationism, or in fact, look, Senator Marco Rubio, who's presumably a reasonably intelligent man, and maybe even educated, was asked, what's the age of the earth? And ultimately, either because he, he actually believed it or he, or he was trying to appeal to some constituency, had to argue that it's a big mystery, that somehow we should teach kids both ideas that the earth is 6,000 years old and that it's 4.55 billion years old, which is what it is. If you think about that, somehow saying that, well, anything goes, we, you know, we shouldn't offend religious beliefs by requiring kids to know, rea to understand reality. That's child abuse. And if you think about it, teaching kids that the, or allowing the, the notion that the, the, that the earth is 6,000 years old to be promulgated in schools is like teaching kids that the distance across the United States is 17 feet. That's how big an error it is. Now you might say, look, a lot of people believe that, so don't we owe it to them to, to allow their views to be present in school? Well, as I've often said, the purpose of education is not to validate ignorance, but to overcome it. 50% of the people in the United States, when we probe them each year with the National Science Foundation, think that the, that the sun goes around the earth, not that the earth goes around the sun. When we ask the question, we, we provide the question, the earth goes around the sun and takes a year to do it, true or false? Almost every year, 50% of the people get that wrong. Now, does that mean in schools we should allow the, 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 the anti-Galilean and Copernican idea that the sun goes around the earth to be taught? Absolutely not. If in fact, the very fact that people don't know that and the very fact that it, enough people are willing to somehow believe the earth is 6,000 years old means we have to do a better job of teaching physics and biology, not a worse job. The last thing we want to do is water down the teaching of biology because some people don't recognize that evolution happened. Evolution is the basis of modern biology, and in fact, if, if a lot of people don't believe it, it only means we have to do a better job teaching it. So once again, I repeat, the purpose of education is not to validate ignorance, but to overcome it and to overcome a situation where a United States Senator can speak such manifest nonsense with impunity is vitally important to the healthy future of our society. Technology and biotechnology will be the basis of our economic future. And if we allow nonsense to be promulgated in the schools, we do a disservice to our students, a disservice to our children, and we're guaranteeing that they will fall behind in a competitive world that depends upon a skilled workforce able to understand and manipulate technology and science. Not very much big thinking in my opinion, but ultimately, whenever I heard him say teach, all my mind thought was indoctrinate. Whenever I heard him say ignorance, all my mind thought was the truth of God's word. This is their ideology, guys. If you don't believe, if you don't believe that we revolve around the sun, you're ignorant. You need to be indoctrinated further, and they're not doing enough enough of a job getting the masses. Did you guys hear what he said? Did you hear what he said, Wes? They yeah. poll people, and I, I don't want to be probed by his poll, but <laughs> he, they said that they poll people <laughs> with their probe every year, 
And they said 50% of these people think that the that the sun revolves around us. Why would 50% of the people think that, Wes? Because it's what we observe with our own eyes. <laughs> you have to reinterpret. You ha- And this is what we can observe, test. I mean, you, it means you have to give up your natural senses and what God tells you in his word and believe something opposite. That's this what is what they mean to. by teaching. That's right. The only thing he said that I agreed with is that when we propagate nonsense to our children, that we do them a disservice. And I just disagree with his understanding of what that nonsense is. Yeah. So guys, if you can, I'm sorry, go ahead, brother. Yeah. If you train up a child the way he should go, he, when he's older, he will not depart from it. So I I agree with that kind of thinking, but the way he should go. (laughs) Yeah. And this is why you've, you've got, you know, people, people thinking they're educated coming out of these institutions that had taken like this guy, theoretical astrophysics, like that's literally something literally thinking about things that cannot be quantified or demonstrated or measured. It's astrophysics. Yeah. Graviton. He can't, he can't go check because he can't go to space. <laughs> he can't, but he's just theorizing about these things. And therefore he gets to teach a class and call himself smart, learned, and that you should adopt what he thinks guys. This is just literally the priests of Baal of Babylon from ancient times. They, they've taken off the robes, they've put on a suit coat, got a little, you know, little scarf and a little pipe, and they sit in their office and have office hours and they do lectures. They just whitewashed the evil look to it. And now it's all in the name of, oh, you're not smart unless you believe what we believe. Yep. Right. And so now it's based more on. Yeah, they got these. Yeah, I don't know. I've never gotten a call for that kind of a question, but <laughs> they don't want to call me. They probably know about Yeah, No, I, I would have gotten it wrong according to them. Too. <laughs> That's right. They don't want those. So, guys, it, thanks for your patience. If you, but you know, there, it gets even worse. We got Bill Nye, the science guy that we who all I saw used to kid. love as a kid. Right. So we Gosh. saw him as a kid. <laughs> he has something to say about your kids. And uh, here he goes. Denial of evolution is unique to the United States. I mean, we are the world's most advanced technological so I mean you could say Japan but generally the United States is where most of the innovation still happens people still move to the United States uh, and that's largely because of the intellectual capital we have that the general understanding of science when you have a portion of the population that doesn't believe in that it holds everybody back really evolution is the fundamental idea in all of life science in all of biology It's like, it's very much analogous to trying to do geology without believing in tectonic plates. You're just not going to get the right answer. Your whole world is just going to be a mystery instead of an exciting place. As my old professor Carl Sagan said, when you're in love, you want to tell the world. So once in a while, I get people that really, or that claim they don't believe in evolution. And my response generally is, why not? Really, why not? Your world just becomes fantastically complicated when you don't believe in evolution. I mean, you, here are these ancient dinosaur bones or fossils. Here is uh, radioactivity. Here are distant stars that are just like the, our star, but that are at a different point in their life cycle. The idea of deep time of this of billions of years uh, explains so much of the world around us. If you try to ignore that, your your worldview just becomes crazy. It's just uh, untenable, self inconsistent. And I say to the grown-ups, if you want to deny evolution and live in your in your uh, world that's completely inconsistent with everything we observe in the universe, that's fine. But don't make your kids do it because we need them. We need scientifically literate voters and taxpayers for the future. We need people that can, uh, we need engineers that can build stuff, solve problems. These are, it's just really a hard thing. It's, it's really a hard thing. You know, in another couple centuries, the, that worldview, I'm sure, will be, it just won't exist. I mean, it's, it's there's no evidence for it, so. She'll deny the liar guy. I love how he starts out saying the denial of evolution is unique to the United States. Bro, have you ever been around the rest of the world? Do you know how many other cultures don't believe American science? Like the, billions of Muslims, billions of Hindu in, in India. Billion, like, bro, 
like talk about a subjective uh, brainwashing statement right off the bat to it and pose on you social shame so that if you don't believe their lies, they're propagating. But yeah. he, he says it straight up like he thinks that, you know, if you don't believe in evolution, then you're causing a problem for society, which is why he goes on to say, we need your kids. We need your kids. They need to indoctrinate your kids early. Yeah. The science yeah. guy world tour must have been canceled because he didn't get to get out. <laughs> and we, let, let us specify real quick, because I got to I got to say, I, I do. A, I believe in a form of evolution, just not the one that he's talking about, because there's things that are are absolutely observable, measurable and testable in reality. We have speciation, there's right. adaptation, there's mutation, and all those things can be tracked and recorded. Right. But macro evolution in the sense of a change of kind, we don't see dogs out here changing into cats. We don't see monkeys turning into humans because that's not how it goes. That's right. And there's no evidence for it. That's right. That's why Harambe was trying to leave the zoo. He was like, <laughs> I got things around me not changing. They told me I'm about to turn into a human. I can't handle it. Yeah, it was crazy, man. So <laughs> I think really the biggest with evolution, it gets um, more publicity, if you will, for the fight than heliocentrism. Right. They, they teach heliocentrism at an assumption level. They push evolution at an argumentation level and they get you distracted while all the while you still believe in heliocentricity all mm -hmm. the while you still think that you go around the sun which in completely is in contradiction to the scriptures but guys just like he said well there's no there's no evidence for it he's talking about people you know geocentricity as well as lawrence cross they think there's no evidence uh they think all the evidence points towards heliocentricity right well i'm gonna walk you guys through real quick some evidence that actually disproves heliocentricity and this is people things that you can see with your natural eye in the sky okay guys so we're told that we can see venus um certain parts of the northern hemisphere they'll say well you can see venus three hours before sunset and three hours after sunset and supposedly in the cosmological model venus is located very close to mercury close to the sun i'll show you real quick just as a quick refresher for anyone who's not familiar heliocentricity teaches that the earth is three planets away from the sun so that we're going around the sun and between us and the sun is venus and mercury they claim that mercury is 43 million miles from the sun they claim that venus is 67 million miles from the sun and at its longest uh, elliptical point earth is at 94 million miles away from the sun on average okay so that means someone that wants to look at venus in the night sky maybe you're a curious little amateur astronomer and you want to see where Venus is, but the sun's already set, which means you have a definitive line you cannot see around. Okay. You have an actual divider line. So how are you going to look at it? Well, you're going to have to go and look at Venus at a certain angle. The most prominent time as recorded by everybody that you can see Venus is at 46 degrees above the horizon for up to three hours after the sun sets. Well, we've got a geom geometry problem guys, because the earth oops sorry i don't know what happened there one second um that's weird yeah the earth is actually right, let me show you guys this real quick um I was, just as an example of what i was talking about let me show you this real quick the earth is actually uh, this is a guy that's looking at venus in the night sky all right so it's that light right there that he's looking at in the night sky he angles up his telescope at 46 degrees. The sun's already set. In fact, this is an hour after sunset. It's claimed to be seen another two full hours after sunset. And that's a big deal because this is the average people on average claim. They can see three hours after sunset, they can still see this supposed star in the sky or this supposed planet in the sky, Venus. Okay. And he's trying to zoom in with his telescope there. We're not going to watch the whole thing, but the point is, um, one second, we go back to the. You can the see it at night animation. there. Yeah. And the word for planets in, in Greek, there, planetes, is a, a word that meant wandering stars. That's so right. it's as if they're just no different than the stars because they're definitely not terra firma physical land masses that could be landed on. That's right. That's right. So we were just looking at the, the gentleman that was looking at 46 degrees. If he's on a ball in space on the dark side of the ball, because remember, every 24 hours you have a dark side of the ball because it's facing away from the sun that means he has to look over the dark side of the horizon down at venus at 46 degrees in the sky but yet here's the problem west the earth is according to heliocentricity the earth is still spinning yeah 
So if it for three hours, if you can still see Venus, that means the Earth has then spun an entire one eighth of its revolution out of twenty four hours. Yeah. Right. So then if he was originally there trying to look at Venus in the sky, but the earth is spinning three hours later, he can still see Venus in the sky. That means he's going to be even that much further away from being able. He's that much further on the dark side of the earth. Right. Yeah. I follow you. The angle got much more tight. Yeah. So then suddenly if he can still see Venus three hours after the sun has set from his observation level, then Venus would have changed places in the heliocentric model and moved between the earth and Mars. Right. Instead of between Mercury and the Earth. But they know that's not what they say happens. Guys, this is impossible. This is not what we observe in our... We, you don't even need a telescope. You see it with your natural eye. Mm -hmm. So according to the geometry of their own model, it's impossible. Can't be done. It yep. doesn't work with what we can see with our own eyes in the sky. And to be able to catch this phenomena... Quote unquote, I would uh, recommend an app. There's something that I'd love to in have included in the show. We just have so much. We're already almost two hours. But uh, <laughs> if, you, if you look up uh, an app, it, it should be an Android and, and both Apple Play stores or whatever the case. That There's an app called Star Maps or Sky Map. There's a bunch of different ones out there. But what they'll do is you'll be able to um, have your camera act as an augmented reality device to be able to point in the direction of different constellations, and it'll show it out on the screen. It'll even show where the, the so-called planets are. And what's interesting to me, the, the greatest thing about those kind of apps is it really helps you visualize that all of what they call planets, including the sun and the moon, are going on an ecliptic. And when you, when you hold this app, you're looking at it, you can turn around and you can be able to see that all the stars are, that they say are fixed in that celestial sphere that I talked about in my video earlier, they just continue to, you could literally stand there with the app for 24 hours, 48 hours, however long you wanted to with that on and just watch the same exact stars, including what they call planets going around in circles around us along that ecliptic. And that ecliptic line is what they call the, the zodiac line where the 12 constellations they call the zodiac are, are right there. That's where those, those luminaries travel through. And so it's just doing circles around us endlessly. And you can see that with an app like that. It's a great visual tool. Great, great suggestion, really. Yeah, that's yeah. right. I actually forgot about some of that. That's that's amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, Wes, do you want to you want to look at your interview with the rabbi? Yeah, I would love to. So let me set this up. This was a Passover get together that we had. And man, long story short, I was invited <clears throat> by uh, some other brothers in the faith to coordinate a baptism for my my area, my region. Um, this was last September, right before the Day of Atonement. And um, some people came out from, man, five, six hours away in some cases. And so it, that was right here on the river, uh, the Brazos River around the corner from my house. And I, uh, we, we got the invitation since I started Bible study with some of those same people. We got the invitation to go to a, a Passover get together. And, uh, we ended up getting there looking at the address or whatever the case and finding out that it was right around the corner from that same spot where the, we did the baptism. And so it was just a godsend. Everything about it felt just divinely inspired. And, uh, we had a great time. You're going to get to see some of the people we got to hang out with, which are also, um, viewers of this channel as well as kingdom in context. And uh, we had a great time. I, I'd love to show you guys the, the interview with a rabbi that Wes Blaze did. So I hope you enjoy it. See the tree, see the sky. presence of his son. a sweet reminder of provision from the maker of all things. we're doing uncommon ground we're, we got a show i'm working on with sean griffin we got a biblical cosmology show going and i'm asking people questions like do you believe everything you see on tv these days <laughs> no, 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 no. what about when they're what, what about when they're reporting it as news and saying that it's it's factual journalism is that always true no no, I gave up on that a long time ago. Yeah. So what about when they say scientists have proven? Is that even always true? If they say scientists are claiming, no? Okay, good. That's like saying the rabbis believe. Well, <laughs> which rabbis? I'd like no, to get this guy's opinion too. Yeah. How long have you been doing rabbi work? Oh, um, currently. 30, years, years. Cool. And your name's Marty, right? Cool. Marty, I'm Wes. Uh, I was in <laughs> ministry for, I mean, I pastored two congregations. I, I was a pastor 18 years here yeah. in Texas. Um, 
and uh, I've been teaching Torah to Gentiles for 35 years. Yeah. Yeah. Grafting them in? Yeah. Getting them yeah. grafted yeah. in? Yeah. And, cool. uh, so then, would you say that you believe, is the earth a uh, ball spinning in space, shooting throughout a space? Yes, it is. It is? Yeah. How do we know that? Because scientists have said it and it was on TV, and they, they reported it as well, this. Well, because, is really I mean, um, because God talks about uh, the circle of the earth. He does say the circle of the earth, right, and the pillars and the right, foundations right. of the earth, and that it's immovable, and that it cannot be moved. And that he fashioned a, the firmament over it on the first page in the first verse of the first, or first chapter of the first book. What would you say the firmament is? It's the earth. The firmament? Yeah. It's called the firmament heaven in Genesis 28. Oh, really? He did. Okay. Yeah, I missed it. <laughs> he, God created the firmament and he separates the waters above from the waters below. And then he calls the firmament heaven. So it couldn't be the earth, right? Well, if you look at the, the Hebrew definition of rakia, is a Hebrew word for firmament, right? It says uh, uh, it's conceived as a solid vaulted dome, a vault of heaven, a solid structure. And that's why it would be able to separate bodies from water. And so this is where you get the theory. A lot of people believe that the firmament was this ice canopy that has been dropped down at the, the flood, maybe. Do you believe it's still there? The firmament? If God created it, and God's the same yesterday, today, and forever, what he creates, he stays. That's right. That's right. I agree. And especially you see Isaiah and Revelation right. both talk about the prophecy of when Yeshua comes back, the firmament rolls open like a scroll. The heavens roll open like a scroll. So it would have to be something solid to be able to roll open. And if it has gates and windows in it, like what happened through the flood. So we're told that we live on a spinning ball shooting through space. I would propose to you that the the scriptures consistently, from Genesis to Revelation and all the, the books that weren't included in the modern American canon, those all have cons consistently spoken of a cosmology much different than a spinning ball and what NASA has told us. It tells us of a flat, motionless, stationary plane of existence enclosed in a dome ceiling with geocentric luminaries rather than heliocentric. Has this uh, been a topic of study for you at all? Never. No? No. It's what brought me to realize that the Bible is true. Yeah. And that Christ is real. Cool. Yeah. That's a good thing. Absolutely. Glad he did. You think we went to the moon? Yes. Absolutely not. <laughs> we can't. We can't penetrate the heavens. There's two of things. My brother, my brother was a satellite controller in the military. Yeah. That's what he did. I mean, and I asked him about it. He's from now. And he's like, they've actually had satellites get too close to the radiation belts up and down on the radiation belt and fry They're so wasted. But they're not even worth retrieving because they've fried them beyond repair. And so how would we get through through through? There's four of them. Four different layers. How do we get through? Uh, our cell phone is stronger than everything NASA had. Oh, I know that. So yeah. we, how will we control a cracker jack box going to the moon? And go there three or four times. And then do a landline call to President Nixon. How do you get thrust in the back? There you go. Yeah, com combustion and thrust propulsion couldn't exist with no atmosphere to push off of or air to make combustion. No gases. They say that they carry their own oxygen with them on the shuttles, but. If you're shooting it out into a vacuum, there's nothing to push off of. Interesting. There's a lot of things like that. that Interesting. This is the tip of the iceberg. Well, I have one more question for you if you want to know. Where is heaven? Um, someplace it's uh, outside of this ball that we live in. So most people, when you ask them, they, oh, they, they, they say, oh, right. So, but if you're hanging off the bottom of <laughs> right. the ball, like in Australia right. down under, right. Right. then that would be a different right. relative yeah. direction it, for it, them. It's, it's, it's... But consistently it says, like, when Yeshua comes back, every eye will see him. It does say that uh, he showed him, uh, Satan took him to a high mountain, shot him every kingdom. There's a lot of things that wouldn't be able to happen if you're on top of the ball and there's the bottom that's out of sight. So there's a lot of those kind of things. But then that, that third heaven that Paul speaks about in Corinthians where he said, I knew a man, whether in the spirit or in the body, I don't know, I was taken up to the third heaven to see paradise. Well, if, if that's up, like the scriptures consistently describe, whereas we're told we live on the outside of a ball, whereas God says from the first page, he's the best author ever, right? So he lays the setting and the place, and he says that he built a house with multiple lever, layers of uh, roof, and that we live inside of that house, inside of an enclosure. And so if you think about things 
is like, how do we have atmosphere, breathable, pressurized, barometric yeah. pressure gas? Yeah. That wouldn't Most exist if we were surrounded by a vacuum because the second law of thermodynamics dictates that the all the gas would be sucked off into the vacuum with no container. God created a container so we could have pressurized gas and he called it the firmament. Yeah, no worries. I uh, just wanted to get your thoughts <laughs> like, on that. I really appreciate I like, it. Absolutely. I like learning. Yeah, it's been amazing because if you once you realize that we're not shooting around through an infinite outer space of a vacuum on the road to nowhere with infinite potential of other life forms, it's nice to think he has a whole bunch of real estate. But what he says in his word over and over again is that this is it. We're the center of it all. And that the heavens are directly above us, and this is the only material world that he's, you know, created for us. And that uh, once you realize that, that he's, he's built this structure over us, and he made all this for us, then you realize that he's close. And that he's not an infinite, you know, you don't have to make up some ethereal galaxy, wispy dimension that he's been in. He's literally in a physical dome ceiling above us. Above us. And there's seven of them, right? Seven, seven heavens. So thank you for letting me share with you, brother. I appreciate your time. Absolutely. There's just it blew my mind because it made me realize we've been lied to and that God is real. Man, we had a blast during that thing. Shout out to everybody that came out. Shout out Alan. Sorry, I didn't get much time before the rabbi cut in. Shout out Josh, my very talkative cameraman. Shout out to uh, <laughs> the Haley's, um, Carrie, everybody that showed up. We had such a great time. And that rabbi, man, he was very talkative all night until we started talking about that. You could tell he disagreed, but he did so very respectfully and graciously. Yeah. And it was an enjoyable conversation. Yeah, that's, that's kind of like the way most of the people I've interviewed so far, they may disagree, but when you're face to face with them, they don't act like on social media, right? They don't use all caps. They don't use, <laughs> they don't use exclamation marks. It's not no. like when you're, you know, when I'm, you see me debating people on, on, you know, YouTube or nothing, they, they kind of hold their peace a little bit more in person. Don't they Wes? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So the good news is for the audience watching, you're watching Wes and I show you what's possible. So when you want to go out and talk to somebody live, you don't have to worry about them getting crazy like they do on social media <laughs> because most people have enough social stability to realize I can't act, you know, I can't show my backside like that. I'm, you know, who, they don't know you, right. They may not know you. Uh, it, so I promise you, you're going to get much calmer reactions, which only allows you the time to get through the scriptures. Yeah. Not like so, they do behind the anonymity of the keyboard. So right. definitely I, I encourage people to, I would love to see people doing more stuff like we're doing. Uh, it's yeah. been a calling of mine for a while and I would love to see some other channels doing some interviews, street interviews like that. Sure. I'd also encourage people to uh, go out and maybe start up a, a yearly annual baptism at your, at your local body of water where you can do that or a Bible study every week. I've done so and I've been tremendously blessed by it. And uh, I'd, I'd hope to see the same for you. Yeah. In fact, Wes, what do you think if people in our audience, if they're actually filmed themselves going through some of these questions with people they know, would we maybe clip that up and put it on our show? Yeah, I wouldn't mind doing that. I, that sure. seems, I would do it too. Yeah. So yeah, if you guys are watching, if you film yourself asking some of these questions, or maybe you have your own questions you want to ask about biblical cosmology with friends, families, believers, non-believers to get their reactions, send us that video. We'll, uh, we'll take a look at it. That's maybe maybe put it in the show. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, you know, it's funny. You mentioned with the rabbi, you know, you guys were talking about um, propulsion. Mm -hmm. You're talking Combustion. about, you know, this, yeah, the right. idea of like, how do these rockets push off of nothing when they're in space? There's nothing to push off of. Like the lunar lander, there's no atmosphere in the moon. How did it push off? Right. And then where's the, the blast crater from the, you know, right. engine that puts <laughs> out 
10 tons of thrust or whatever the case. Yeah, that's I'm going to show that in a future video. It's actually um, I calculated the weight of the supposed lunar lander versus the engine it would require to, to blast it off. And it's the same required power that an F-16 jet uses. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I'll get I'll show that in future episodes. But um, but yeah, I think it's hilarious because, you know, even like right now in modern and, you know, the, the NASA SpaceX news right now is that there's a rover on mars they i just, saw that they just dropped a new rover with the little satellite helicopter drone yeah a little four pound four yeah pounder. and you're like there's no atmosphere on mars what's it using to propel itself with its propeller it's, it's called a nasa propeller. magic <laughs> yes yeah, so we actually have some unique footage from uh nasa with this little this little helicopter trying to get off the surface <laughs> of the moon what did you do <laughs> yeah yeah you're surprising me with these tonight i love it try as they might guys they're not they're not they can't get through the ferment can't much less get to this uh point of light not an actual ball in space they can't even get through the ferment to get to the point of light we refer to as mars which has an angelic escort by the way which means if they did get there, they'd probably something bad would happen because the angel's not going to let them hang out. So, yeah. I mean, none of this, none of this makes any sense with, with what we're told in scripture. Um, you did a great job with that interview with the rabbi West. Thank you for Thank being you, willing to be persistent and loving at the same time to try to show like, Hey man, here's the scriptures. What do you think about this? Cause the, the like you've heard me say this before in the past West, the Bible's a big book over 800,000 words. The American Bible has 66 books in it. Other Bibles around the world have even more up to 80 books. Um, it's a big book. There's a lot to know. There's a lot to study. And not everybody studies all of the books. Sometimes certain ministries, they just focus on certain parts of the book, you know? So we try to give people the benefit of the doubt. And we just lovingly want to remind them of all the book. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's one consistent message. And once you understand certain pieces that have been left out, you know, to your understanding, so much more of it starts to make sense. That's right. That's right. So, Wes, I'm excited. Next week, we got a musical guest, Mike Maranatha. Yeah, Mike is a cool dude, man. He's a he's been a watcher, uh, you know, somebody that's in the audience of our shows, both of them. And uh, he makes his own music. He's got quite a bit of content out there. If you search Mike Maranatha, you're going to get a, a topic page on YouTube, just like somebody that's a, a top 40 artist would have. He's got albums with ASAP Preach. Uh, I'll leave it till next week because uh, there's nice. a lot. There's a lot he's been working on. Here's one of my favorite songs from him. It's just a clip. And uh, I got something else after this. Go ahead. Scriptures lift me cause the spirit is with me No more feeling empty cause he blessed me plenty yeah. Time is running out, I see the kingdom in my hand Jesus, Jesus coming back, you better see why you can Yeah, he the lion and lamb, he draw the line in the sand You better turn from your sin and put your life in his hands ah. yeah. Jesus is the only Yeah, top down It's one of my faves good stuff mike we're gonna have him on next week and something else to look forward to for that episode is that we will be premiering a brand new song featuring myself west blaze music as well as mike maranatha i made the beat he wrote the hook we both got a verse it's a banger i look forward to sharing it with everybody world premiere next week next wednesday check it out you're on mute sean we're gonna be giving away some of these soon here's those holographic stickers i was talking about earlier boom <laughs> nice. Um, let me pull this up real quick. And uh, yeah, we're excited, guys. Go check us out on um, on West Blaze's channel if you're watching this um, in any other forms. Like I know we're we're also on D Live. We're broadcasting there live right now. We're on Twitch. We're on Facebook Live. Um, uh, go subscribe to to West Blaze on YouTube as well because that's I think where we get the most of our viewership at this point. Cool. Yeah. So that's important. And then. I'm going to put this up here. We'll, we'll end the show with one of West Blaze's songs real quick. Yeah.
<laughs> so we thank everybody for being here. Wes, did you see any questions in the chat that you thought we might want to address? Oh, quick? I'm still learning how to do the whole live stream thing. I, I haven't been looking, but uh, right. <laughs> we'll be on top of that. Maybe next week we'll get a, a live Q&A session with Mike Marinoff. That'd be cool. Nice. Nice, brother. All right. Well, guys, we'll, we'll play us out with one of uh, Wes Blaze's songs. This is called Flat Smackin'. Flat Smackin'. God bless everybody. <laughs> Thank you again, Sean. Appreciate yeah, you. You're welcome, brother. Blaze music. Eat, eat, sleep, sleep. Debunk the globe, repeat. Eat, eat, sleep, sleep. Debunk the globe, repeat. Once you go flat, you don't go back. Got a bunch of globes back at home up in the trash. I'm not even really tripping if I get laughed at. Cause everybody here is about to get flat smack. Earth is flat jack, flatter than a flapjack. We about to flat smack. Globes get your backpack. I'm with my flat pack. Globes in the trash sack. As a mutual equidistant map up on my snapback. Flat smacking everybody at Joe's Crab Shack. Looking at us like what we're saying is so abstract. Lesson one, no curvature there to be found. How can it be evolved if nothing about it is round? Lesson two, three. Three quarters of the ground is covered in flat water. Do you hear the way that sounds? Lesson three, take a look at the stars that you see at night. Same constellations that you've been seeing for all your life. And never trust NASA, because nothing they say is right. They're lying right to our face, and they mark us in plain sight. You can straight up see the wires and the green screen glitch in the water bubbles floating on the spacewalk missions. It's detestable. I refuse to be another vegetable. Pseudoscience garbage will to me be unacceptable. And anyone with eyes to see don't have to be susceptible. Dispose of your globe in the nearest waste receptacle. We backpacking all across the plane, and we flat smash. And activism right out in front of the university Like how is it at night that we can see Venus and Mercury Shouting out the proof that debunks the globe of absurdities They taught to us as facts since the nursery Courtesy of a sun-worshipping fraternity Commercially, they perverted people universally Robbing us of truth like the biggest ever burglary You heard of flat earth but didn't know it was the truth But we didn't see it either till somebody showed us proof So if you got a Facebook, we can keep you in the loop It's official flat earth and globe discussion group, baby Once you go flat, you don't go back Got a bunch of globes back Back at home up in the trash. I'm not even really tripping if I get laughed at. Cause everybody here is about to get flat smack. Earth is no globe, closer to a snow globe. Flat earth proofs, boy, I got a boatload. Gotta keep it flat, that's the F-E bro code. Yeah, we coast to coast and we coming to your postcode. Take a good look at the rocket footage in slow mode. So many let the camera trick, I don't see how they don't know. When will people see that it's distorted like a GoPro? You might not believe the earth is flat, but me, I know. So the heat up at the meetups, we in the streets and we speak up. And I met you from the feet up, trying to see if they can keep up. I know that they sleep, but we need them to leap up. So I'm specializing in waking the sheep up. Earth is a plane, geo Centric contained, opened up with King James and it's saying the same. I know it's so easy to go with the grain and it's strange the alternative sounds so insane but we came to this thing just to change up the game cause the lames wanna tell us we came from a bang. A treacherous trickery straight from the flame and the devil's the one to be blamed. It's a shame. Wake up the matrix. Shake up the fake with the truest of truth and the atheists hate it. Cause we got a movement that blew through the roof. Take it to basics. Yeah. To make an improvement, we gotta recoup. If you can debate it, then come to the page. It's official Flat Earth and Globe Discussion Group. Yeah. Eat, eat, sleep, sleep. Debunk the Globe, repeat. Eat, eat, sleep, sleep. Debunk the Globe, repeat. Eat, eat, sleep, sleep. Debunk the Globe, repeat. Eat, eat, sleep, sleep. Debunk the Globe, repeat.